Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this edition of the Journal Club on behalf of the Arrhythmia Academy. Uh, I am Diraj Gupta from Liverpool, uh, and we have a very interesting uh, topic to discuss today. As you know, one of the uh, concerns we have in EP is our lifelong exposure to radiation. And there have been many advances in the field of 3D mapping, which have reduced our exposure to radiation. But still, transeptal punctures remains a stumbling block, and most of us struggle uh, to reduce our radiation exposure prior to transeptal punctures. To that end, there was a very interesting publication recently in the journal Europace uh, from a group from the University Hospital Freiburg in which they have described a novel method of using 3D mapping to uh, guide transeptal punctures. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome the lead author for this paper, Dr. Heiko Lerman, who's with us today who's to discuss this uh, topic. So welcome, Dr. Lerman. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gupta, uh, for the introducing uh, words. And thank you very much for the organizers for having me to talk about our latest publication. As you pointed out, um, the publication about is about 3D map guided transeptal puncture for left sided catheter ablation procedures. And I called it another step towards a zero fluoroscopy PVI procedure. I will quickly show some slides around this topic. As you all know, radiation injury is um, divided into two uh, injury patterns, deterministic effects. You all know that from cataract, epilation, skin damage. It's a direct damage to the cells and every cell has its uh, threshold dose. You can see that in the graph uh, on the upper part of the slide. So with increasing uh, radiation dose, severity of the injury um, becomes larger. And on the other hand, we have the stochastic effects, uh, which we are uh, concerned a lot in, in the EP field, for example. And the problem with that is um, development of malignancy in the long term. With this kind of injury, we um, expect a damage to DNA. And as you can see on the slide, on the upper part, um, the model which probably describes that um, is the linear no threshold model, which means we have no threshold, like in deterministic effects, even the lowest dose can induce um, radiation injury and the uh, linear curve applies. So with increasing radiation dose, the risk increases linearly. And what you can see in the graph is, for example, um, it's dependent on age and sex. So children are very much prone to this injury pattern female a little bit more prone than male patients. And um, the concern is a little bit less because of the reduced lifespan in elderly patients, but still it's apparent. So um, when we looked at our data in 2018, uh, during primary PVI procedure in the years 2005 and 2007, as you can see on the slide, we had a um, median effective radiation dose during the procedure of about 10 millisieverts. And um, this is equivalent to about 500 chest X-rays. In the following years, 2008 and 9, um, because of introduction of the 3D mapping system, actually with a lack because the operators had to get used to that, radiation dropped um, significantly during the procedure to about half the value. And in the other years with um, adaptions of the X-ray machine, more collimation and let's say uh, putting um, or uh, introducing a LARA much more in the lab, radiation dose could be reduced over time. In 2015, we made a further adaption to our um, X-ray machine, and we called this the low-dose uh, fluoroscopy program. And um, by that time, we could reduce the uh, quite low radiation dose of about 0.9 millisieverts, which is equivalent to 45 chest X-ray approximately, um, to more than half the dose to 0.4 millisieverts. And um, this, is, this was by that time the radiation dose we all also needed for a simple procedure, like a so slow pathway ablation procedure in patients with AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And uh, still, this is about uh, the equivalent dose of 20 chest X-rays. So by that time, we asked ourselves, is zero fluoro possible? And what are the steps 
we need to take. And uh, we found, as you pointed out in the introduction, um, the major limiting step at our lab was uh, the transeptal puncture, the fluoroless transeptal puncture. So um, we started here with a uh, work from Martin Eichenlaub from our group in 2020, and we tried to identify the oval fossa in the 3D electroanatomic mapping system. And we included 61 patients, and we looked for three approaches, the pure anatomy-guided approach, which, which is so shown on the left side, a voltage-guided approach, where we had the hypothesis that, the, um, that in the fossa ovalis there will be a low voltage area which discriminates um, in comparison to the healthy tissue around that area and the protrusion technique. And the work, I don't want to go into detail, but the best method to identify the fossa ovalis was the protrusion technique. So with the uh, multipolar mapping catheter, it was a lasso catheter in that study, we were able to protrude the oval fossa and thereby delineate it in a 3D mapping system. You can see this in this cadaveric image. Um, as everyone knows, the uh, oval fossa is a very thin structure. We have a view now from the right atrium onto the fossa. The lasso catheter is in the middle of the fossa and with the backlight, you can see this very thin structure. And um, by uh, protruding or by pressing into that structure with the lasso catheter, we can protrude this structure into the left atrium. So another um, helpful tool was uh, the radio frequency transeptal needle, which we used um, together with a 3D mapping system. Why did we use the radio frequency needle? Because it has a blunt tip. And um, as you can see in the video, I will show in a second, um, the, the needle is um, advanced out of the sheath in the superior vein of cover. And the blunt tip prevents perforation um, of the uh, cable vein. So blunt tip, blood pressure measurement as with a normal needle. This together with a 3D electroanatomic mapping system and a certain connection box that you need um, makes a visualization in the 3D mapping system uh, possible. So I'll quickly show this in this video with a typical transeptal puncture. So let's see if I can start that video. Okay, now you can see the acquisition. That's the, the first step, acquisition of the right atrial geometry um, um, with a lasso catheter. All the spots are marked, superior vena cava, right atrial appendage, um, his position. And here you can see we start delineation of the oval fossa. We take some time, protrude this uh, area. His is marked. And in the next step, you can also map the um, coronary sinus catheter. In this case, we didn't um, map the sinus catheter, ca um, so the coronary sinus, but we just placed the catheter in there. And then the transeptal puncture. This is the visualization of the needle. You can see that we move it uh, down into the oval fossa. And we are now in the protruded area in the second. Uh, in the, on the right side of the image, you can see um, a posterior view of the atrium and the needle is in the fossa ovalis. Then during application, no, uh, first step is unblinding. So in the study, the operator was blinded um, to the TE. You can see here in the TE, um, the, ne the adequate needle position. And then we press onto the needle. And now we have a short loss of visualization because um, during our application, the mapping system had, has to be turned off. Then we um, switch it on again and push the needle into the left atrium. And that's basically the transeptal puncture. I will show that because it was maybe a bit fast on the, on the next slide, a little bit more in detail. So during that study, we uh, examined or studied 104 patients undergoing a PVI procedure at our center. You, see, you can see the baseline characteristics. I think, importantly, one third of patients were about redo procedures, and maybe we can discuss this later. Only five patients had cardiac devices. So um, as the first step, we, uh, we marked the oval fossa with the protrusion method, and um, we performed 114 transeptal puncture attempts in these 104 patients. As you can see here, the operator was afterwards unblinded 
when he felt uh, that he had a good position uh, within the oval fossa, the puncture was performed, as I showed, and the puncture site was marked on a 17-segment model of the oval fossa. And this is shown here. We have the view of the right HM again with the oval fossa, and we put here the 70-segment model onto the fossa. And as you can see, in the center, about 28% of the punctures were directly in the center, and most of the other punctures were directly adjacent in the inner rim of the oval fossa, but there were also a couple of punctures um, within the fossa, but on the outer rim. I will show this here a bit more in detail. So one thing, it's a bit time consuming, obviously, because we don't uh, use the X-ray. So per TP attempt, but this includes um, puncture of the, as a positioning in, uh, of the sheath in the superior vena cava, moving down in the fossa, puncture the fossa, uh, going onto the left side, um, and then also advancing the ablation catheter on the left side. This took us about 70 minutes in the study. So um, um, uh, the attempts were successful in 97% uh, of cases. We had no uh, transeptal puncture related complications. And as I pointed out, a good position, which was centrally or in the inner rim was um, apparent in 84% of patients. The adequate position, which was still within the fossa, but not in the inner circle, occurred in 16%. And there was no out of fossa positioning and there was no dangerous position, which was defined as uh, imminent puncture, for example, of the aortic root. Um, here are the, uh, the parameters. Was it really fluorless? It was really fluorless in 43% of patients, but we needed a tiny amount of X-ray for wire visualization. Um, um, to put the Y on the left PVs and 56% of patients. Maybe you can discuss this as well. But overall, fluoro time, um, you can see the results here. It's in median zero minutes and fluoro dose um, was also zero in the study. So um, as a take-home me message, I want to say identification of the oval fossa is best achieved with the protrusion techniques it's our opinion, um, and the 3D map-guided transeptal puncture is feasible and safe in most of our patients, but at a cost of some additional time expenditure. Um, I didn't show you the RM RA mapping time, which was around six minutes, and then also the puncture, which was, I've shown the data, seven minutes overall for placement of two sheaths and the left HM and all the catheters. We have certainly limitations. One limitation is the sole use of the RF needle in our study. I described the rationale for this. And uh, one of the limitations is wire placement in the pulmonary vein. And um, I mentioned that before X-ray was necessary in 56% uh, of our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Heiko. That was a very interesting presentation on a very interesting study. So thank you for that. Um, I had a few questions, uh, if that's okay. First of all, um, you mentioned that about, I think, six of your patients had cardiac devices in situ. Did you experience any challenges with these patients in terms of what steps did you take to prevent wire entrapment uh, within the pacing leads? That's a very, very good question. I think that's a actually a limitation of the technique. Um, we would not recommend and we cannot um, take this from our study with only five patients that it's safe to perform this approach in patients with cardiac devices. I actually feel quite confident in patients who have like a, a single or dual chamber pacemaker or defibrillator, which is um, in situ for many years because everyone who does elite extractions knows um, that the that it's it's very difficult to dislocate the leads, um, but still we would not recommend that, and especially in patients with CRT devices, I think uh, we have to be very very careful because there's no use or it's it's not good if you dislodge leads only uh, to re reduce uh, radiation exposure in the cath lab. 
So basically, um, we were in those five patients, we were um, very careful with mapping also with the into the SVC, for example, especially with the lasso catheter, which we prefer for the, this technique, because you can easily um, put the uh, lead into the lasso catheter and it dislodge it also into the SVC. And then obviously, if you have the puncture, sometimes you have trouble with the atrial lead because the sheath can go uh, through the atrial lead or adjacent to the atrial lead and, and uh, put some uh, pressure on the lead here. Yeah. So I think your point is very important and uh, I would not recommend to uh, use this technique without studying in uh, device patients here. Okay. So now that your study is over, what is the default strategy in your catheter laboratory? So for patients who have indwelling devices, for example, CRT devices or, or multiple leads, do you still like to use fluoroscopy or would you try this fluoroless 3D mapping technique even in those patients? I think what we do at the moment, um, we if you use, I think, the pentaray catheter, it's much more safe than the lasso catheter. So typically in those patients, we use the pentaray catheters. But before transeptal puncture, I, I take usually a, a, a picture of the, or use quickly fluoroscopy to see that I'm not displacing the atrial lead. That's what we do at the moment. Sure. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the choice of your catheters, uh, does it matter which catheter you use in terms of uh, visualizing the protrusion of the fossa ovalis? I would have thought that the uh, lasso catheter, because it's a bit stiffer, it might be better to show the protrusion rather than the pentaray, or is that not the case? No, that is, that is exactly true. That's what we realized. And there were studies about the protrusion techniques also and other centers uh, could not uh, reproduce our results. And I think one of the major steps, and we see this in our patients as well, is that the lasso catheter is uh, much better for protrusion and exactly because of the reasons that you mentioned than the pentaray catheter. It's also possible with the pentaray, but it's, it's, it's much easier with the lasso catheter. It's also possible, uh, obviously, with the ablation catheter. So for simpler procedures like WPW, we just take the ablation catheters because we don't uh, use either pentaray nor lasso catheter in those cases. Sure. So does this technique allow for multiple transeptal punctures as well? Yeah, that's no limitations at all for the technique. Um, the typical approach uh, during PVI procedures in our center is just a single transeptal puncture and then we um, we search the uh, puncture site with ablation catheter. That's the reason why we only had only a couple of uh, dual transeptal punctures. But that's not a limitation. But I think uh, uh, another important discussion, and the reviewers actually of the papers pointed that out, is can you um, decide the puncture site? Because maybe you want a more anterior or more posterior puncture site in certain cases. And I think we would not recommend this at the at the, at the current point because uh, the needle visualization is only, as I showed you, with a point. So we don't see the needle as a complete structure and we don't see in which direction is the orientation of the needle. So basically, we at this, at this point of time, we only recommend a puncture of the central fossa with this technique. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you needed a little bit of fluoroscopy just to uh, help you get the guide wire into the pulmonary vein. Uh, I wonder whether you have any experience with the radio frequency versa cross wire in which, you know, as you know, you can loop the wire in the left atrium so you can push with impunity. You don't have to worry about parking the wire in one of the pomni veins if you have any experience with that at all. Yeah, unfortunately, the study was quite advanced by the time we got the versa cross uh, uh, guide wire at our center. But this is exactly true. We had... Well, actually, we only used it for five cases, um, but this was very easily done with a Versa cross. Um, we didn't use the X-ray for that, but this was not studied, obviously, in this um, paper. Um, and with five cases, I certainly cannot uh, say that this is safe. Uh, what we realized, and uh, this is another thing, especially with a CARTO system, um, you're dependent on the matrix 
So the matrix of the left atrium, you get that with your advancement of the multipolar catheter into the oval fossa and the matrix, it reaches then a little bit into the left atrium, actually a couple of centimeters. But uh, what we saw with the Wurzer cross, we, we saw the, um, the, the wire on the left side, but when we advanced it, we lost it on visualization. So to overcome this limitation, we had to map the CS a little bit more. So we mapped the complete CS. So then you get some matrix and you get the visualization of, the, of uh, most parts of the left atrium. And then you can again visualize the vessel cross. So I think this is a, is a very good point um, because we were quite unhappy that we had to use the X-ray in about um, a little bit more than 50% of patients. Um, because I think it's not only about radiation reduction. The radiation dose is quite low nowadays during PVI uh, procedures, but maybe we can think about a next step. Maybe we can have cath labs without any X-ray system in the room. So, in fact, that's um, what this I wanted would to ask. Only then be possible. Uh, because what you really want, it, it, as you said, the amount of radiation now is minuscule, it's less than a minute for an average PVR procedure. So, your incremental savings are not going to be in radiation protection, but, but in the other aspects. For example, if you can make your workflow truly fluoro free, then you don't need to wear a lead apron. Nobody in the cath lab needs to wear a lead apron. And as somebody who suffered from back-related problems, I can tell you that that would be a huge yeah. advancement uh, if you don't have to wear a lead. So in your laboratory now, what is the strategy? Do you all wear a lead? And once you've got into the left atrium, you take a lead off? Or do you now feel confident enough that you don't even wear a lead when, when starting a PVI case? Yeah, we actually stopped wearing leads. And we only put them on if we really feel it's necessary um, to use the amount of X-ray. We also, we, we do a lot of uh, procedures during general anesthesia. So we still have the TE probe at the moment for our patients. And um, you can actually confirm wire localization um, also with the TE, obviously. But this, this is a very important point. And I think um, this has to be pointed out uh, because prevention of malignancy is with, as you said, a radiation dose well below one minute and a very, very low, low dose. That is not the point in the future. It's getting rid of the X-ray machine. It's also an additional cost for for a heart center, obviously, um, and um, get rid of the apron and yeah, work with uh, also um, yeah people with back problems, as you mentioned. Yeah, that's I think that's certainly the next step. Yeah, fantastic. Finally, um, many of our readers and listeners would like to know what kind of a learning curve they can expect if they have to try and replicate your technique. So can you just tell them a bit about that, please? Yeah, I think the learning curve is actually quite steep. We see that with our fellows. So typically we do it in, in a way that they watch like three, well, they, they, they are, uh, um, are taught in transeptal puncture. They, ca they obviously can do transeptal puncture by the time, but then we start with about uh, seeing three procedures and then they start. And um, usually uh, we look uh, during the procedure for like three or four or five more uh, transeptals and then they are confident um, to do them on their own. I think there are, there are two very important steps and um, a couple of uh, people who use ice a lot also, um, they, they um, are a bit concerned also with the um, advancement of the needle in the SVC. And I pointed that out during the presentation, but I think this is very important. So we actually do not advance the needle out of the sheath in the SVC, but we uh, position the needle at the, at the end of the sheath and then uh, push or take back, pull back the sheath over the needle. So we never advance the needle. Um, there are a couple of centers that use the normal needle. We don't use that because we think the blunt tip of the RF needle is even a more uh, safety thing. But I think someone uh, doing that, uh, it's really important to pull back the sheath and not advancing the needle. So I, I want to mention that. And then the, the next major step or the most important step is actually delineation of the oval fossa with a protrusion technique. Taking down the needle from the SVC, we are used to that and that's very easy. You can see it in x-ray and you can see it uh, in this uh, technique 
on the on the 3D mapping system. That's no difference. Actually. Sure, sure. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that's been a very interesting discussion, and I hope our uh, viewers and listeners would um, would be intrigued by this technique and would be motivated to try it on. Um, so thank you very much indeed. I think we have to wrap up now because we're running out of time. Um, so I would like to thank uh, you, um, obviously, for this uh, fantastic presentation. And I would like to congratulate you, Heiko, for this lovely paper. And I would also like to thank all our listeners for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.